So by the standards of later battles in World War I, the fight here for Spion Kop was, was pretty small really, but actually it was the biggest, most important battle the British Empire had fought in a long time, and the number of dead in such a small space was terrifying. So I grew up watching football at Leicester City at Filbert Street, and I used to stand in the Kop, as it was called, and that wasn't the first Kop in the world. The first was that in Liverpool at Anfield, and it was named after this hill we're visiting now, Spion Kop, which was the scene of carnage. Okay, so first lesson learned when visiting the battlefield of Spion Kop, don't arrive at the gate before nine because it's locked. So I'm here on top of Spion Kop, and behind me you can see the Tugela River, which had been holding up the British advance towards Ladysmith for a long time. Warren and his troops crossed just down there, but they spent too long messing around, too long doing dress rehearsals, and by the time they came up this hill, the Boers were already entrenched and ready for them. So eventually, after a lot of messing around by General Warren, he finally gave the order for the Lancashire Brigade to storm this place just behind where the camera is, Spion Kop, the highest hill in the region. Over a thousand men of the Lancashire Brigade were chosen, tough men, mainly reservists, and they had to move along this spur at night in silence. Not easy to do with so many men and their equipment. At one point, a dog started barking at them. And instead of killing it, one of the troopers made a lead from a rifle strap and led it away back down the hill. And the advance continued. So it's hard going even on the plateau, isn't it? <laughs> just with two books, it's hard going. And you think you've come over the top just there. And there's a ways to go. Part of the problem for the advancing British that morning was they didn't really know where they were going. They had no maps, they had no decent intelligence. The Boers knew this ground like the back of their hand. They were always going to be struggling to dig in in the best positions. So the men who led the British assault that night were from the Lancashire Brigade. These weren't the tried and tested troops that were meant to be leading the attack. Instead, they were mainly reservists, tough guys, no doubt. Many of them had done a lot of years as regulars before being called back to the colours. But they hadn't been in South Africa long, and this was their first taste of real battle. So as the British troops came over onto the plateau, just short of the crest, there was a couple of Boer sentries. They fired off a couple of shots, the British chased them with bayonets, skewered this guy, and this is his grave. It says, in memory of unknown Burger sentry killed on this spot. One report I read said that he might have been uh, a black guy fighting with the Boers, but I haven't read that anywhere else, so I don't know if that's true or not. So now the British moved here onto the top of the hill and they started digging but they didn't have enough entrenching tools and this ground does not lend itself to digging trenches. But they did what they could, they had a shallow trench and they thought they could dig in now and that was kind of the battle over, they thought they'd won. But soon the Boer sharpshooters started picking them off and they realised that this position was actually incredibly dangerous. By the end of the day this trench was filled with dead. The British lost 243 men killed and over 1,200 wounded or taken prisoner during the action here. And the dead are commemorated on this beautiful memorial right next to the main British trench on the top of the hill. Side by side, two unknown British soldiers. And in the middle, Lieutenant the Honourable Neville Windsor Hill Trevor, I think that says. It's kind of hard to read, it's quite worn. All I can read on this post here is the words brave soldiers. I've no idea what the rest says. So around 8.30, as the shell fire was getting really heavy, the man in command up here, Major General Sir Edward Woodgate, was mortally wounded by a shell splinter right here on the northeast corner. So three future world leaders were present at the battlefield here. One was Winston Churchill, Louis Botha, and Mahatma Gandhi. He was a member of the Indian Volunteer, in fact, I think he was the founder of the Indian Volunteer Ambulance Corps. And there's a new memorial here for those guys and for the Black Scouts who largely remain unnamed and unknown. It says that this monument is dedicated to the memory of the extraordinary bravery, courage and devotion to duty of the Indian stretcher bearers and Ambulance Corps and African Scouts who displayed most conspicuous bravery and acts of self-sacrifice in the presence of extreme danger on the battlefields of Spion Kop and surrounding areas during the South African War. 
So the men in these shallow trenches didn't have a lot of cover and they were being hammered both by artillery fire that was coming in at a rate of 10 rounds a minute and enfilading rifle fire. A lot of guys got shot in the head from the sides. So one thing that's hard to appreciate is how confused the fighting was here. It wasn't as simple as here were the British, here were the Boers. Actually, they were intermingled. There were groups here, groups there. Some Boers were behind the British. There was others in front, some to the side. It was really confusing. There was bullets pinging off these rocks with colleagues falling all around them. At about 1 p.m., a number of British troops started to surrender. They started waving their hankies. And before they knew it, the Boers had moved forward and started rounding up prisoners. At this point, Thornycroft, who was now in charge of the troops on this hill, came storming forward. Take your men to hell, sir, he said to the Boer commander. There's no surrender here. And he was a big bloke, 22 stone and massive. So people did what he said. It was about now that the reinforcements started to arrive. First into the fray were the Middlesex Regiment, who immediately swept into a bayonet charge, trying to clear as many of the Boers off the ridge as they could. Meanwhile, the burghers of the Carolina commando were trying to come round the back of the British. If they had managed that, they would have been carnage. But right on cue, the Scottish rifles arrived, fixed bayonets and cleared them away. OK, so I'm here on the east end of Spion Cop now. The main British trench is over there to my right. But what I want to show you is two important features. There was Alu Nol, Alo Nol, which is just over there. And the Boers had riflemen on there who could control these slopes, which made it very difficult for the British to manoeuvre. Further over is a, a feature known as Twin Peaks. And on there, the Boers had artillery pieces and more riflemen. And amazingly, the British hadn't attacked this until in the afternoon, in one of the rare pieces of initiative, the King's Royal Rifle Corps that day decided to storm it. They pushed and pulled their way up and they took that feature there. It was really important. The Boers considered Twin Peaks to be the key to this whole battle. And when they lost it, they thought it was over. They thought they'd lost the battle. But amazingly, Redvers Buller, in command of the British troops in Natal, saw the colonel of the King's Royal Rifle Corps on there and demanded he come back down. He didn't want to see them get killed. Uh, and despite ignoring multiple requests for him to come back now, down, eventually the CO of the King's Royal Rifle Corps was killed. And the man who took over his second in command couldn't keep ignoring Buller's orders to come down. And despite holding the key to the battle, they withdrew. OK, so after walking around this battlefield extensively, I think I'm starting to realise in greater detail what the problem was. The British had entrenched themselves over there, which technically is the high point of the feature. But as you can see, there is a bit of a ridge between me here and where you can see the British Memorial that marks their position. That allowed cover for the Boers, who still controlled this dominant position on the corner looking north, which meant they could keep bringing up troops without being harassed. I think that was part of the problem. If the Brits had moved forward and taken this corner of Spion Cop, they might have done better that day. And so the battle, despite being won, was thrown away. The British, as night came, still held Spion Cop. They were actually in a great position. They were ready to sweep the Boers before them and move on to Ladysmith, but they didn't know that. They thought they were gonna get a hammering again, and instead of staying here and using this to move forward and relieve Ladysmith, they pulled back and went back to square one. Another example of terrible generalship. I can only imagine what it must have been like to have been a British soldier up here who's fought all day long, whose mates have been killed and badly wounded, and then told, now we're going to withdraw and go back to where we started. I'd have been terribly angry. <laughs>